Hi guys, welcome to the second discussion that we are having on Greco-Roman philosophy. As you know, last time we discussed the apology of Socrates, and for this session, the topic of our discussion is the Republic of Plato, which is a long treatise written by Plato on uh, construction of a just city and of a just individual. and the republic was written uh, of course in the 4th uh, in the 4th in between the 4th and the 5th century greece and that was a time where there is there was a lot of political turmoil that was going on in in ancient greece of course the death of socrates was a very shocking incident for the entire institution of philosophy that it existed at that time and we know that after that happened plato went on exile and spent 12 years of his life lord knows where like there are different accounts giving his uh, that reveal his locations uh, for in egypt in mesopotamia and some uh, and you know there are some conjectures as to he came as far as to the bank of uh, river ganges in india uh but that uh, that no, that is a matter of historical conjecture which we are not here to indulge in today we are talking about a work that he Uh, wrote after coming back and uh, coming back into the Athenian society, and after found founding his uh, great school, the Academy, which is a sort of a role model for all of the in the entire institution of a university. It was by all means, uh, we are also members of the institution that Plato founded back in ancient Greece. That is the Academy. so uh, the republic uh, is of course uh, called uh, by you know by many scholars including alan bloom who's like one of the foremost scholars on the republic that it is it was the first uh, treatise on political science although uh, the political science as a subject as a discipline that we know today did not exist at that point of time it was still uh, an attempt at construction of a man's of a of a person's uh psychology of a person uh, of a of a of a states uh you know of workings and you know how how and and of of course of the idea of justice which is which is something that takes a central theme in our discussion of the republic of course uh, and you know as all all of most of plato's work that survived today this was written in a dialogue form and the republic takes place at a dinner banquet where socrates along with uh, many other friends of socrates and brothers of plato glaucon adamantus and uh, the sophists like uh, you know thasymachus were all sitting together and you know they were discussing about the what what justice is essentially and then you know there are many arguments given by different people about what justice is and socrates proceeds to in his uh, unique fashion uses the socratic method of elenchus to dismantle all these arguments and you know to sort of uh, uh, cre create a vacuum of uh, of understanding of knowledge uh, to the point that we come to a point where you know there is uh, that there is a deadlock and we cannot proceed further which is called the aporia which happens at the end of book 1 and after that happens of course there is a uh, i mean there are many attempts at construction different constructions of justice that are given to socrates but then all of them you know sort of uh, is an attempt to take the best arguments that are that exist against the conception of justice at that point of time and then proceed to uh, proceed to attack them and you know uh, establish the value of justice as a virtue which socrates goes on to demonstrate uh, firstly uh, the 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 principle of specialization is uh, is uh, is an important point of republic wherein uh, plato divides his ideal society into three parts first are the rulers who are supposed to rule the republic then are the guardians or the soldiers who are supposed to protect the republic and then there are the producers who sort of produce all the uh, you know uh, goods and services so to speak in you know commercial jargon that exist and that are necessary for survival of the state and of course uh, then you know uh, uh, plato lays out a very elaborate uh, you know scheme of how this society would pan out how education would work here and 
you know, after the construction of his just state, he gives an analogy of how this political justice can be used to mimic the justice of an of a of a human soul. And he he says that the same way that the state, uh, you know, a just state is divided into three parts, that is the rulers, the guardians and the producers, the same way uh, a soul is divided into three parts. That is the rational uh, rational part, which always seeks towards, uh, you know, which is always uh, seeking the truth. Then we have the uh, the the spirited part, which always seeks honor. And then we have the appetitive part, which, you know, uh, uh, which, you know, exists to uh, want and, you know, desire uh, things like food, water, shelter uh, and, you know, sexual uh, pleasure and these sort of things. So uh, Socrates says that in a, in a just society, the, 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 the best part of the society, that is the rulers, who he calls the philosopher kings, the aristocrat who, who, who are philosophically engaged, they rule the world. And similarly, in a person, in a just person, the best part of our soul, that is the rational part of our soul, rules other parts. That is, it keeps the spirited part and the appetitive part in check. So that is how uh, Socrates sort of gives uh, 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 an analogous construction of, uh, uh, of both a just society and a just state. And then there is a very important uh, allegory which is uh, that he gives, that is the allegory of cave, which is perhaps one of the most important uh, metaphors given in all of Western philosophy, which go on to base uh, discussions on idealism for many, many centuries to come. That is uh, Plato's analogy of cave, which I'll, which I'll just explain for the benefit of the people watching it on YouTube or who might not be familiar with this concept. It is that Plato asks us to imagine a cave which is very dimly lit and the prisoners in it are, you know, uh, are held in shackles so that they can only look ahead. And what happens is that uh, behind this, behind this is a partial wall on which there are statues that are manipulated by people who are out of sight. And behind that we have a fire. So the entire, the, the outcome of the setup is that the people who exist in the cave since birth, they have only seen these statue or these, uh, these shadows that are moving in front of them. So what they think is that, you know, these, uh, these shadows are the real things. There is nothing be beyond reality except these shadows. Okay. So what happens is uh, that, uh, that uh, the, the next step is, of course, that the, the shackles of these prisoners are loosened and then they actually stand up and see the, uh, and see the, they see these uh, uh, statues for themselves. And then they realize, oh, the shadows were not the real things. There is something that is of a higher reality than these shadows. And these are these statues themselves. But these uh, statues themselves are imitations of a, of a different reality, which is, which is something that they witness as soon as they go outside, as soon as they go outside, for they have never seen the light of the day. They are dazzled by, you know, the entire uh, light that is out there. And then they see all these objects, the houses and the trees, and then they look at them and then they realize, oh, you know, these are the, these are the, uh, these are, there is a higher reality than these statues. And these are the real objects that these statues try to imitate. Right. And then after their eyes adjust to the light, they see the suns and the heavens and everything. And then they realize, oh, the sun and the heaven is the source of all the light. And, you know, it is hence, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the reason why everything is possible around them. So uh, this, of course, is an analogy for to construct the metaphysical uh, reality, which, you know, uh, which is, I think, which is, which is not be, you know, so much a subject of our discussion right now, it will be subject of our next discussion. But for, uh, for a basic understanding, what he means to say is that the world that we live in, the physical realm that we witness, it is only, uh, you know, uh, it is not the ultimate reality, the ultimate reality is something that he calls the world of forms which is that the abstract qualities that we, that is not visible to us, but are intelligible to us. That is, we can access them through reason. They exist and that is the higher form of reality, which he wants to portray through this, uh, uh, through this project. So what ex essentially he's trying to do, he's trying to uh, demonstrate to people the importance of education. That is, what is the uh, impact that education has on our soul? It is that it is dragged out from a, a reality where he, everything is being witnessed in the shadows. And then, you know, uh, then education drags the person 
as far as out of the cave as possible right uh, that the the first reality is of course the uh, the 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 realm of uh, the first reality is the realm of imagination which is the shadows and after that uh, uh, through education the person is pulled to the realm of belief which is the real statues right and after that the person is pulled out to the realm of thought so yeah that is the plato's world of that he's talking about the the role of education being to realize us to the higher reality that uh, our theorizes so uh, that said of course uh, you know uh, in the construction of a just city there are many uh, you know things and many practical arrangement that you know uh, offend our uh, you know a modern sense of uh, liberty and our modern sense of individual freedoms but again that is a subject of discussion which we are going to have right now so um so let's uh, without any you know delay let's just jump to the discussion part uh, i would like to discuss something about how morale what morality is because the, like there are multiple time discussions about what morality is and they have been defined differently so maybe we could go about that because i'm very uh, unsettled on what how or how to define morality do you mean uh, like uh, how morality is defined in context of uh, the the republic yeah yeah morality as per is uh, i think not something that is extensively talked about in the republic it is justice that is talked about a, a lot right and i think uh, there is a definition of justice that is given i mean yeah there is a, of course a sense of moral obligation in justice right because in the first book we also see how um, you know uh, the one of the opinions that are given to uh, socrates is you know fulfilling by by you know the athenian elder uh, that is cephalus is that you know justice is just rendering your legal obligations and being honest right and towards the 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 the, the definition that is given towards the end is somehow you know uh, com- somehow relates to it does not it does not you know directly mean okay that is that but of course uh, there is some relation that okay you know there you have a certain role that is provided to you by the society and if you you know engage in that then okay that is uh, just and that is something that you should do which is basically something that is moral so yeah of course for plato's uh, sense of morality is uh, you know shaped uh, very uh, in, you know very in detail by his sense of justice so i just wanted to highlight the doctrine of ideas and how plato fits into his own ro- doctrine like what is the purpose of him propagating his utopian society like what is his motivating factor because that's something he highlights about the society right so the guardians would fight because of the pride and so on so what is his motivation i want to bring that point up that is a very good question as to what is uh, plato's motivation behind construction of just society and i think that is something that we can connect to our previous reading on uh, you know plato's uh, i mean the apology of socrates and after the death of his teacher do what do you think you know if we do a historical analysis of plato's life there are like very clear indications of why he is engaging in the sort of behavior that he is i'm i'll be very happy if someone can you know give a reflection on that from taking points from the previous meeting or you know even if you want to give an original thing on right so i think uh, it's a very interesting question ever thought of it like overtly but i think this obviously ties into plato's dislike for democracy because uh, we'll remember that democracy is what got socrates killed and we already know that plato was somebody who admired socrates quite a lot so when socrates died um, unfairly plato was plato was obviously very deeply affected and he left as well for 12 years because there was a danger to his life and so he went around essentially just seeing like different parts of the world seeing how how society is formed in different places and then trying to essentially nail down what best how best society could look like for people so i think republic is is him just growing up in the turmoil of his time seeing so much chaos and so much degradation and then him asking himself throughout his life that how can i what is the best form of government to remedy this problem so i think that's why he writes this book yeah definitely there is a you know sense of order 
that prevails throughout the republic and that is something that he really really wants to preserve of course i mean uh, given the kind of uh, you know a history that uh, that uh, that you know the athens had and the sort of you know disorg uh, the disorganization and chaos that democracy uh, was you know uh, unleashing upon ancient greece it is uh, he certainly felt that you know there is a sense of order that should prevail and and mind i you know mind if i say uh, an overriding sense of order that uh, sort of you know uh, numbs other consideration but for uh, for plato's uh, you know thoughts it was for very good reasons because of course he that uh, the love of knowledge that word philosophy propagates is something that is not uh, you know you don't see that uh, you know being appreciated a lot in a democracy right uh for example you don't have you don't always have the most educated and the most well versed and the most well meaning person winning elections right even in like modern democracies so there is of course a sense that uh, of you know uh, of of plato's contempt towards disorder plato's contempt towards you know uh, hatred of knowledge or you know this uh, devaluing of knowledge and i think that is a sense that really prevails here, that he wants to uh, and that that is something that alan bloom of course always also says that it is a second apology a second defense of philosophy that he's trying to give through this so yeah of course i think nitai uh, that is uh, one of the answers to your question probably that his uh, intention behind constructing this city is of course constructing a just city according to his ideals but also a city where philosophy is preserved right so maybe something to add to that towards the end of the thing the piece that we were reading we see how plato speaks of justice and for him justice is coordination so that for that adds on to your point about order and that's his driving force behind as utopian society so yeah that's one point um so yeah uh, that is about uh, order and plato I, I, any, does anyone want to bring in something that you know uh, that uh, that could be a point of discussion uh, you know people who have read the notes or the, you know some of the readings whatever um yeah so something which i wanted to add but something came up at home so in will durance book a part which i found really interesting and at the same time pretty contentious was in the criticism of plato in which essentially will durant says that plato's ideal society in some way was seen immediately after um immediately after plato's age in that during the dark ages when you had the rise of the clergy in political power and when it was effectively the clergy who were governing the countries uh, will durant says the clergy like plato's guardians were placed in authority not by the suffrages of the people but by their talent as shown in ecclesiastical studies and administration by the disposition to a life of meditation and simplicity and so on and on so will durant's essential argument is that maybe we can say that plato was influential to this degree that his model of governance was actually followed in europe and will durant cites this as an accomplishment of plato and of plato's philosophy that we can see how um, we can see how far it reached and how it was actually applied in society and i disagreed with this part because for one i didn't find um, will durant's explanation that the clergy were the guardians in society as plato described them very convincing i thought that they had a very different role from what plato wrote about the guardians and secondly because i thought that it's only one fragment of plato's entire grand vision which was somewhat implemented um so i didn't really see this as a success of plato in fact i didn't find much relation to plato at all so i was wondering what everyone else was thinking about this. so like i think uh, i mean this is practically mentioned in the book itself that the what do you say the the domination of the church can also be uh, attributed to the economic uh, economic factors that is what uh, will you know said is that basically during those times since agriculture was a primary profession Uh, and uh, more or less people not able to control the rains or the factors affecting agriculture they kind of need something to believe in and that is how uh, that is the reason why the church has got power so again i don't think uh, like this connects plato to the public with what happened during that time yeah i think yeah i i, I think nimal is right in that and i and i do agree with him because um yeah as he said this was something in the book too 
about Plato's about the objections that people have had to Plato's work on economic grounds. Um, essentially, saying that when you divide, you don't want to divide the city into two parts. There was something like that. I don't remember quite quite well. You don't want to divide the city into two parts or two sections, but then you divide it into three. And essentially, when you divide the economic functions, so many political thinkers, especially well, centuries after Plato, have shown how political power essentially flows from economic power. And while this may be contested, I don't think we can really have too many objections to it. I think we can all see it as a reality of life that with economic power does come political power. So Plato assigning economic functions to one class and then completely non-economic political functions to one class was very, very impractical, in my opinion. And, and, and as we can see, this really fell apart. Like a, As a theory, it may sound to some, it may sound wonderful, but it really did fall apart in the years after Plato and in the uh, societal organizations after Plato, which is why I found that comparing the clergy to Plato's guardians and saying that, look, this is a success of Plato's theory did not make sense because the clergy was backed by large sums of money and political power. Yeah, so I found the economic aspect of this really interesting. You know, I think uh, uh, the point about uh, clergy being guardians and, you know, of course, is somehow, uh, I mean, ingrained in the idea of how they are, I mean, the people who have access to knowledge. And that is something that, you know, Plato also said, oh, you know, you don't need to educate everyone about everything because there are only some people who can, who have the natural capacity to get the form. And there are some people who are, you know, um, uh, there are some people who are, uh accustomed to one thing and and that is of course a questionable assumption which is quite it was questioned uh you know later and that is something that we can talk about separately but my uh point of contention uh was that the socrates uh you know city that he was constructing was not uh, and that is a point that is you know brought up again and again by Socrates and, you know, in, in the book by Socrates and Adamantus and Glauc on that, the city that is being constructed and, you know, Adamantus says, oh, you know, I mean, like the king, being a king in this, uh, you know, sort of republic does not look like a very decent job. I mean, it's very hard, it's full of hard work. Then, of course, Plato says that the goal of uh, this society is not to just make one class happy, right, at the expense of the other. It is to make a city where people are as happy as they can be. But was this uh, something that was kept in mind while, you know, dividing the city into this clergy? I mean, I mean, okay, whatever form you want to give it, you want guardians, clergy, whatever. Was this taken care of? Was the job of clergy to do, provide the functions in a manner that was best for the entirety of the population? Or was it a self-serving endeavor? And I think uh, we can... Uh, bring in parallels from India's caste system as well, right? Which is uh, something, a more, a more rigid version of the hierarchy that Plato is talking about, right? Which is that, oh, you know, at one stage you have people who who are knowledgeable and, you know, who should uh, who should be, you know, guardians of knowledge in a society. And then there are people who do this work, that work, whatever, right? But the essence of it, it was that, oh, you know, there is one class that uh, that, you know, has access to knowledge. But was the goal of the Brahman or was the goal of the noble clergy, was the goal of all these, uh, you know, upper echelons of social hierarchies to serve the other or be self-serving? And I think that is a point where uh, this entire, uh, you know, relation with, uh, uh, you know, Plato's Republic sort of tries, you know, sort of loosens, right? as to what was the intention of these hierarchies and how they were dissimilar to Plato's hierarchies. Rather than pitching in, I would like to give it a different style of question. So basically, if you look at the caste system in India, uh, we kind of see as, like, it is perpetuating the caste system in the sense that the person born in a particular, born in a particular caste would have to do that certain profession. But as opposed to what Plato has kind of said that we should do, it says that if a person is found not to be having the certain skills or tra uh, skills or intellectual capabilities, you should not be sad to step down or do an, an another job. So that is something there is something that's different from the Indian system. So the question, like what I felt while reading this, and I think would complement the first question raised, is that uh, was in Plato's idea is a society divided into three because it has to be divided into three because some people have to do certain work or because he believes that 
humans are inherently different that their intellectual capabilities are different when they are born than like when, just when they are born so that is something i felt we should like if we could answer that we could probably answer the other question basically is why was society divided into three is it because uh, the certain functions had to be done or is it because plato believed that humans were inherently different uh, like their intellectual capabilities and their ability to do work were inherently different from birth basically that is uh, something and uh, that we can discuss even in our next session about you know plato's metaphysics and how he uh, of course people in those times uh, used to think right about how everything is oh you know there is a sort of a higher reality corresponding to a lower one and you know how things have a certain way of manifesting themselves right because they did not know physics they did not know chemistry they did not know all these things they did not know that you know earth is of course you know somewhere uh, you know a, a planet that is revolving around that is a something something some knowledge that we have that you know they didn't have access to so of course their ways of thinking were different and you know it would make sense for a person in that time to believe that a, f- a person has inherent qualities because you know universe as such was not dis- deconstructed by them to understand that you know oh we are just here we are just atoms and space and you know we are just uh, organic organic materials assembled together so i think yeah of course there is a point there is a point of discussion on that and that is something that existentialists take up in 19th century right with the advancement of you know darwin's uh, uh, evolution theory and everything that is something that comes into scene there so of course it is a very pertinent question uh, of course uh, you know in today's time of course that assumption would not stand and plato would have to give you know reasonable if there are any reasonable explanations for that but uh, i think uh, i mean uh, uh, like for that time i think we if we analyze in that context i think that is an assumption that we allow him the liberty to make when we were talking about the caste system i was reminded of the myth of metals right which is essentially um, they invented the myth that everyone is born with a different metal in their soul and essentially um, referencing the divine in some way that this is by divine um judgment that you're given these certain capabilities and it's very similar to some explanations for caste given in the early hindu texts that everyone is born from a different part of the divine brahmans are born from the head and so on and so they have different capabilities and this then led me to a completely well not completely but somewhat disconnected thought which was even in the ideal society even in plato's and socrates's ideal society you would expect philosophy to be the staple of the people that everyone has been imbued with the values which philosophers cherish right firstly being rational thought and even in this society they are relying on a myth which is something which is completely anti philosophical something which philosophers detest they are against myths they are against lies they are in a search for the truth and yet these people who claim to be in a search for the truth will use a myth a grand lie to keep their so called ideal society in order and that is something which i find to be a big contradiction in plato's republic and a big contradiction in his conception of a just state for someone who claims to hold truth above all else who claims to dedicate his life uh, to a pursuit of the truth his conception of a just society is um, based with a lie it's grounded with a lie and that's something which i felt that we could discuss because i see this as hypocritical and i see this as contradictory to the claims of philosophy itself but maybe people could have different perceptions of it maybe sometimes you have to make some concessions in order to achieve justice i am that's a very good point and i don't think it just stops at being at metal remember that in the book plato actually advocates banning of everything that's blasphemous to god essentially he wants to spread divinity and religion and make right, people believe right. in it he wants to just censor texts that do not fall under his conception of right and wrong so so if you actually understand this from point of view of we want people to be rational beings just banning everything and not giving people exposure to them doesn't make a whole lot of sense so i think i think again uh, an explanation for this can be in the way that plato divides the soul into three parts and he says that one of three parts is prominent in people and i think effectively plato says that most people are simply not capable of thinking enough to see beyond just whatever they read or see beyond a superficial level 
probably that's why he bans advocate um, and so much actively. One thing which I'd like to also add is that Plato talks about how um, this was in Will Turin's book about how a question was posed to Plato that how will you prevent the rulers from becoming inflexible? How will you make sure that they're not entrenched? And Plato essentially says that they'll be trained to see the good. They'll be trained to be men of action, not men of thought, and so on. So they won't become inflexible. But at the same time, Plato's entire system is inflexible. Plato's entire system is based on entrenched um, hierarchies. Plato's entire system is meant to be the perfect system, which will continue in perpetuity. perpetuity. And so that is another contradiction which I found. Was there that Plato in one breath will say that no, the, the rulers will not become inflexible, but in the second breath will say the system is inflexible. So, yeah, that was another contradiction which just came to my mind. And that is again a brilliant point that you have got, Ayan, of course, about inflexibility and you know how Plato t- tries to justify oh, you know, a person who is reasonable will, of course, not do these type of things, right? And uh, that is, of course, a very uh, primitive sort of understanding about how reason works. And, you know, that is not something that we always see panning out, right? Because when we are young, we see, you know, I mean, I think I relate to this immensely. I don't know how much others will. But, you know, I used to think, oh, you know, people are talking about all sorts of these things. If only people were reasonable enough, if only people were, uh, you know, used facts and logic and, you know, these type of things to uh, understand their reality, there would not be so much ignorance in the world. But then you see people who claim to be sort of, you know, uh, vendors in the marketplace of ideas who sell you facts and reason and you see them making spurious claims. And then you realize, oh, you know, it is not always the person who is the most reasonable that is the most just because reason is not something that will take you from point A to point B. It can take you to several points. And that is not the understanding of reason that, you know, comes with uh, uh, with an understanding that, you know, the Greeks had or the, the, the people in the Renaissance had. They thought that the reason is the ultimate tool that takes you to the truth. And if you reason enough and if you reason hard enough, then you would reach the ultimate truth, right? And if you don't reach the ultimate truth, maybe you have made a mistake in between. It is your job to rectify the next generation of philosophers job is to rectify that. That is just the basic belief, right? But of course, as logic matures and as we as per people mature, right? We realize that, oh, the people who sell you facts are not always the people who have the most, you know, uh, just opinions. And uh, or even, you know, uh, people who claim to be the most just do not have the most rational opinions. It works both ways. Right. And also philosophy matures as a discipline and tries to question is reason the correct tool to sort of read the truth? Is there something as an external truth that exists that we can reach? Right. And that is a conception that, of course, uh, Plato uh, does not, you know, uh, try to address because, of course, he sees around us the society ruled by unreasonable people and says that if only people were reasonable, this would not happen. So, of course, that answers one part of, I think, the question about inflexibility. And second is, of course, the the question about, uh, you know, constructing world on such an authoritarian basis on such, uh, you know, this uh, he claims about how justice is a vir- i mean the you know knowledge of philosophy you know n- knowing how to do philosophy is a virtue and the most just person is the person who uh, you know engages with the forms who engages in philosophy but then he restricts philosophy and forms to a very certain small group of people so a question that uh, uh, i mean that could be raised to plato plato is your justice only for these people in this small set of people that you call rulers that you claim to be the best do not the people who are, you know, the part of the pleasantry, the plebeians, don't they deserve to live just lives? Don't they deserve to be at harmony with themselves, to have their soul in order and have their soul in a just condition? So I think that is a pertinent question. And that is what he's saying, you know, oh, the people who are above are enlightened and they know everything. And they, their job is to control the rest by, you know, whatever means and devices and tricks that they can. And I think that is a point of discussion that we should really stick on to. And if someone want to speak on that, I would, I would love it. Please do. So just one point adding to Abhinit's point on justice and how it's only reserved for certain people in society. 
just quoting from Will Durant's book, um, Plato says that justice is the having and doing of what is one's own. So essentially, what I infer from this and the lines after this is, Plato, in his idea of justice and coordination, gives a equal, gives equal opportunity to everyone to achieve that level of education of learning philosophical thought through his democratic educational methods. So essentially, what is happening is he's creating a merit-based system wherein not everyone needs to have that level of thinking, or essentially where not everyone may be able to understand that level of thinking. While I understand that that is flawed, the way in which he's carrying it out makes certain sense if you take into context the, the period of time and the downfalls of democracy before that period of time. So I feel like that's where he's coming from here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, that is, I think, a point that Plato, uh, you know, tries to make is that, oh, you know, not everyone, cash, you know, can access the forms because, you know, there is inherent limitation on people's capabilities, right? So, yeah, of course, that, uh, you know, runs into, and that is a very good explanation, of course. But yes, again, uh, the problem is, of course, the dissonance that we feel by applying our sense of, you know, justice and our sense of uh, understanding of the world to try to, be, you know, project it on Plato's time. So yeah, definitely. And Nitai, the explanation that you gave is wonderful. I, I do concur with what Nitai said. I do think that's a good explanation. Uh, at the same time, I can't help but think that, um, well, we never again enemy of the state. Essentially, taking, philo uh, taking philosophy from being something which the state actively persecutes into something which the state actively promotes or at least defends um, was so central to Plato's thinking while compiling the Republic, that Plato builds an entire state where philosophy will be protected. In fact, philosophy will rule, but philosophy will not be given to every person. Philosophy will be included in the education of the rulers, but not the common people. And I cannot help but look at that logic and feel like there is not a logical consistency here. Plato cannot argue that philosophy is the highest virtue and then say that, you know, this will be the most virtuous society, the most virtuous republic, and then also deny the highest virtue to the people of the most virtuous republic. I, I, I fail to see the logical reasoning in that. Because I fail to see the reasoning, I fail to see how that flows. So I can't help but think that that was influenced by his own motivation of ensuring that philosophy rules the state and a philosopher isn't persecuted by the state again. Right. So I I think I'll try and disagree with you there and maybe theoretically defend what Plato was trying to do in practice. I don't think this situation can ever happen. But I think here is what Plato does. Plato essentially says that why we will give everyone an opportunity to learn philosophy or to show their mettle in philosophy. Because we know that he takes away every child under 10 from their parents and then theoretically at least gives them an equal opportunity to show their talents and what they can do. And then he tries to go off on an elimination test. So what Plato I think is trying to do here is he's first saying that we need society to exist for anything to occur. And he says that the best way to do so is to ensure that the most learned, most good person, a philosopher king, is in place, is in is ruling. So I think the understanding of forms and all that is just to ensure that society can function in a normal way. And I I personally do not believe that this book is a second apology or a defense of philosophy per se. I think Plato lost quite a bit of hope in people after what happened to Socrates and what he saw in other societies is essentially aristocratic rulers doing just fine and where they were. So I think Plato would not necessarily block off philosophy as in like the Socratic philosophy of knowing yourself from people. I think he'd still ensure that if you did that or if you encouraged others to do that, you wouldn't be hunted down by the state. But I think at the same time, just giving people, giving one person or a few, few select people the idea of forms was a way to ensure that society actually ran properly. Because as he himself admitted that if everyone got to know about it, then they'd misuse it to mislead others who didn't. I think I would disagree with you in that manner. I think I would like to uh, agree with Devayan where he said that this, this is probably not a second edition to the apology because it might be, but I do not think that is the primary purpose. I, I personally believe the primary purpose of the 
of play to the public was that he wanted some order in his society or in his place so uh, just to quote from the book justice is not mere strength but harmonious strength desires and men falling into that order which constitutes intelligence and organization so basically i believe he was a smart person and he kind of understood that not everyone is equal and the kind of jobs that each one has to do has to be differentiated and just as devain said this is process elimination uh, was probably the best solution to it because he was not discriminating on anyone on the base of their birth or anything else but so- something that could be technically justified as their personal intellect so since these test Uh, kind of uh, find the best person suited to do the role i think his uh, idea that philosophy is supreme and the people who uh, rule the place do uh, needs the most knowledge of philosophy i think i do agree to okay yeah. uh, <laughs> thank you namal yeah no uh, yeah 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 no no just uh, another like different point or divergent thought from this because yeah also yeah the man the man i do think that 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 is a fair enough point that there were certain tests but i just thought um it, like how the essence of socratic philosophy like the core principle of socrates's philosophy is summed up in two words right know yourself socrates says a person should know themselves and very funnily plato's ideal conception is you should be told about yourself far be it from people knowing themselves people knowing what their abilities are we have to invent a myth about yeah we have to invent a myth and tell people no this is who you are so it, it did make me wonder do we find any divergences from what socrates what would socrates have thought of plato's conception of the state we know that he would have agreed in a large part because so much as the republic contains what socrates himself said but i feel like this one place is also something that that is very contradictory to socrates's philosophy of knowing oneself so do you guys feel like there's any other parts in which socrates oh, sorry in which plato sort of digressed from socrates i think i'd like to ask is it is this actually socrates speaker is this plato using socrates and how he used to it send out his ideas and give it credibility yeah so so the thing is that uh, republic is one of his latter works right uh, so yeah mostly it is uh, plato using socrates as a mouthpiece for his own philosophy because i mean that the forms and everything was plato's conception so yeah we we need to treat it as that we know that socrates did not like democracy himself but uh, of course the, his method of philosophy was elenchus you know the socratic method talking to oneself not giving elaborate explanations of a uh, order or you know elaborate positive philosophy about you know uh, claims uh, metaphysical claims and things like that so yeah of course it was uh, um, a, like it was plato speaking for socrates yeah which is why i felt like it could be a which is why i felt like the words were plato's so these are plato's thoughts even though they might have socrates colon like prefixed before them plato saying that no this is what socrates said i'm i'm very sure that they were in fact plato's thoughts which is why i found it peculiar that they seem to run counter to the socratic principle of knowing oneself that first and foremost every person should know themselves which sort of further cemented my belief that philosophy for plato was definitely not something that he envisioned every person to have in their lives and this just cemented my thought yes uh, certainly um, i mean there is i think uh, plato uh, as far as you know his claim about how a certain individual is born endowed with some qualities that of course uh, you know stands on loose grounds given our more uh, you know the modern understanding of how the world works but i think there is certainly an element of uh, individual capability that we could you know uh, use to sort of base uh, you know an understanding of uh, of you know uh, reality i mean when you sort of make these grand claims about how you know oh this is the correct way to live uh, your life then of course there will be people who will not fulfill, feel you know who will not uh, you know uh, sort of fit into these pigeon holes right and then you say oh you know uh, this is the best way to live but since only a few people can live in such a way the people who are living in the correct 
correct way should tell others how to rule right so yeah uh, because uh, of course there is no artificial sanction that uh, plato is uh, you know applying there that he's not saying that like you know the rulers should not you know the ple the plebeian should not allow you know should not be allowed to you know even have the pursuit of philosophy in mind as you know the caste system then in india right oh brahmins will have uh, access to all knowledge and you know the people below will not be allowed access to any knowledge and if they try to then they will be you know sanctioned for that they will be punished or they will be you know uh, but so of course Plat plato does not uh, you know put that sort of sanction in it or on 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 uh, his you know hierarchies but of course there is a sense of constr uh, an artificial construction of the world that is uh, that that you know it's sort of that, that it goes back to circular reasoning right uh, the 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 point is the point being made is the philosopher should rule the world who is making the point the philosopher is making the point brahmin should rule the world i know you know should have the all the understanding and should be the ultimate you know a class of people who's telling that brahmins are telling that right the clergy are the most you know i mean the most uh, superior part of you know or, and because their knowledge balance are who's telling you that the clergy is telling you that so there is a sort of circular element and you know whatever uh, you know race you get whatever class of people you give power to they will say oh we are the best fit to rule the world right so one could make or oh, you know what what separates philosophers from other classes of people right because in democracy what happens the plebeians and you know the people the common people they have the power and they say that we are the best fit to rule because we have the mandate and we have the suffrage and you know things like that so of course every class can sort of make assertions about uh, about you know the way that the world should work and uh, of course they would try to prove it but because philosophers and you know people who have access to knowledge are the best ones to uh, you know who have the best capability to do it one can make the case okay you know these people will be able to do it and you know that is why the people who have access to knowledge have been the people who who have ruled the world for centuries i mean i think we're going on a tangent now i'll start discussing fuko anytime soon <laughs> all right please um, if someone pitch in oh yeah i was just saying that and another thing which just came to my mind was that uh, yeah because i was looking for contradictions in this right and i was reminded of socrates banning poets at the same time i was reminded of how they were saying that there's only the three main things worth pursuing in life um, i i might be paraphrasing a bit but essentially their emphasis on truth and beauty and justice and well socrates holds beauty very dear clearly and then socrates will banish poets so where is that beauty flowing from beauty is coming from the philosophers beauty is coming from what the philosophers decree beauty to be the people who actually create beauty the poets have been banished so yeah it's that same circular reasoning which flows yeah, back yeah yeah amazing amazing <laughs> the people who are producing beauty are banished from the republic and there are these philosophers telling people oh what beauty is you don't you don't know not you don't know anything about beauty you are just lovers of sights and sounds that is of course a quote that you know socrates uses to describe these people who do not you know get the form of beauty they just you know sort of uh, like and create beautiful things so i yeah, think that is a, yeah <laughs> yeah please go ahead Like the Brahmins, you know, writing treatises praising written word, right? I don't remember which treatise it was, but we have, we were shown it in class one day about this really really long poem written in praise of text. You know how beautiful language is, how beautiful writing is, how beautiful Sanskrit is, and that's a question that actually our teacher asked us to think about. That while they will praise written language, while they will praise Sanskrit, they will also only teach it to themselves. They will only allow. their own kind to learn and their own class their own caste rather to learn it so yeah it's that circular logic which also can be found here philosophy is beautiful but it's only the philosopher kings who will learn it you know i i think it's a tendency in a lot of these um ancient systems which are meant to be lasting forever any system that you have which claims that it will last forever will be so rigid and so inflexible and so authoritative that they will praise things and then only keep those things for themselves you won't see plato praising economic work as such you won't see plato writing praises of farming of livestock herding whatever why because he's relegated those functions to a class which subconsciously definitely he considers beneath him he considers that i am a philosopher i should rule I, it's not my work to farm so why should i write about how great farming is i'll write about how great philosophy is 
about how, how great duty is because i will be the one producing the duty so yeah that's all i had so i think moving the discussion further i just had a few inputs on justice which is which was apparently plato's entire point so the question we started with is what is justice and the answer we get is hey this is society you have your this 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 work and do what do what you have to do and then you ask plato hey what's individual justice and then there's no answer just do whatever you're ordained to do by philosophy exactly. exactly yeah 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 that that's something i was thinking about as well yeah. how how justice how plato defines justice as in um, i think this was in abhinit's notes as well or maybe it was in the book i don't remember but essentially they give plato's summary of justice in a single sentence and then they say for people looking for more depth to the answer this might be disappointing and it is it, it is disappointing yeah essentially his sense of justice is you know where the rational part of your uh, you know uh, soul rules and the rational part of your soul tells you to perform the duty that is given to you by the state right which you are naturally most suited to do so of course i mean there are i mean you know parallels about how this sort of this is an authoritarian uh, you know uh, the structure of how plato is considering is you know and how its sense of justice is or oh, you know do what you're told that there is a sort of contradiction that you know we have uh, uh, yeah 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 i'm getting it i'm like yeah there is some sort of dissonance context which, which he was thinking you know uh, where you know Uh, you have uh, people who are inherently you know endowed with uh, you know power you know inherently endowed with the capacity to do something where where do you have a point where you know you would say that okay you know what maybe this person is you know i mean he is good at these things and you know good at these other things and maybe he might 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 not be good at other things but there is a sense of uh, i mean of course we do not go into a very individualist analysis of it because plato's philosophy is not individualist we're not living in a liberal democracy but yeah i think where where do you guys like to push it while reading the whole thing like i don't think we have we really have to blame plato cuz i don't think he was unaware of the logical fallacies in his reasoning i think he was forced to make certain decisions so as to put up an ideal situation which could be considered practical in certain ways because i think he understood that he cannot get away with just talking about reasoning because i feel his idea that they needed a religion and they need to believe in a superpower worked as a fail safe to the people or basically to the majority of the people who could not understand what he was saying or could not follow what he said so i think he was not he didn't i don't think the mistakes or the fallacies we find right now are accidents but those are things he was totally aware of but he still put them there so that he can come up with something or come find the finished product i think that's yeah yeah definitely level, level yeah they yeah, are great great remarks uh, yes of course uh, this uh, of course you know there is a sense of uh, you know okay the maybe the things that he's talking about uh, is uh you know something that not all people might be able to grasp and you know if they if if you know if assuming and given the assumption that there is an ideal way to live of course uh, an assumption from you know which uh, greek philosophy operates from that there is something called virtue and truth that is attainable right so you know in attainment of virtue uh you know you you might construct a very logically valid path but you know what is the use of it if others cannot follow from it right i mean uh, we can see it in our society how people you know who have great ideas about how society should be run and how about you know give, give great political theories about organization of society but you know that does not find acceptance in you know in the general public who sort of you know kept attach themselves to old ways who attach themselves to dogma who might attach themselves to whatever uh, sort of you know uh, obstruction to progress so of course uh, there is this question about uh, you know uh, yeah i mean how do how much do you blame plato for that i mean building an authoritarian state right because uh, if he, if there is an uh, there is an ideal uh, you know there is a just I, ideally just state and a highest form of virtue that is that is that that, that can be achieved through reasoning 
how do we reach that if you know the, the majority of the people who live in that society are not able to grasp understand you know what what this sort of you know uh, construction is so if and and that that is of course runs into a question about uh, you know uh, very complex questions about you know educate and, and and you know the like education of people of uh, the masses and how do you bring the, you know because of course uh, grasping complicated concepts as much as we would like to believe that you know if you understand the if you explain some things to certain people in a logical lucid manner they would get it but that we see that that is not something that always happens right people have i mean people do not always change their minds when faced with different facts do not always change their mind when presented with different uh, uh, arguments or you know different reasons which might be better than the dogma that they hold so i think uh, i think you know there is a discussion there is a discussion to be had about the inherent limitations of human nature of course i mean i'm taking great liberty in in you know, considering i'm speaking this in more, you know uh, in a in a very different setting where philosophy is happening in a very different state but you know i i assume this liberty because we are talking about uh uh because we are talking about ancient greece so i am assuming that there is something that we can say is that there is something called the inherent human nature and a construction where everyone gets philosophy everyone you know is gets reason and everyone you know just rationally agrees with on 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 different points is an you know is an it's not a construction that can be had so just your opinions about that i mean how do uh like i'll just sum up the question because i've been speaking for since long and you know i don't want to become like uh you know person who sort of begins their speech and you know by the end of it people have forgotten what he said in the beginning so i'll just sum up my question it is that uh, how do we you know construct an ideal society if there exist one if there are uh, you know provided that there are limitations on human nature to grasp that uh, you know uh, to grasp that ideal just state how do you in that society uh, achieve that without being authoritarian if there is any way well your yeah, yeah your question your question reminded me of something interesting i read uh, a long time back and effectively asks is like hey do you wonder why every religion is effectively authoritarian and quashes and censors everything else so like do you think that there was never any religion in the past that appreciated dissent and and the author essentially said that of course there was but doesn't exist now because it dissolved right that's why they that's why all of these long structures have existed for so long because they just they effectively had monopoly over a way of life and they prescribed it and any derogation was criminalized effectively so then you have this question of what is a just society and and the question really is that can you have a just society or the question really is is are people actually willing to do people care if they're living in a just society or not how much do people care beyond themselves or their family because a lot of the critique of uh, democracy that socrates gave it still resonates with a lot of people today as well and that should not that really should ask you that okay is this how humans have always been very reluctant to look into themselves very reluctant to think about what is right or wrong or what is good or bad beyond a very superficial level so i think really that is the question that are people going to care enough about justice to go beyond just sloganeering to effectively work as a whole to form a just society then i think the second point you have is the fact that obviously not everyone agrees so you're going to have differences over what a just society is going to look like so i think personally i'd conclude that there's no really non authoritarian idea of a just society because you necessarily have to force people to come under the way you live and for most people that's going to be fine they're going to rationalize it in some way or the other yeah i think i can pick up from where they went left and to and so the question of uh if a uh, ideal society is possible i think we have to firstly look at what do you mean by an ideal society are we looking at the society at large or when we talk about justice is is justice to be delivered to each and every person 
or to society at large because i personally do not believe that the interests of society do not coincide with the interest of each and every person i think the the quest answer to that would give us an answer because i don't think we can have both at the same time thank you nimal thank you devayan and let me just remark what an absolutely fabulous point you brought in devayan about yes there might have existed religions that were liberal but they have dissolved and we only have the authoritarian ones right and same thing we can say about institutions right about institution states and things like that everywhere we see we find that um, you know the institutions are authoritarian institutions are ex- exerting their will why can't we have institutions that are free and you know are liberal to the degree that they allow in- individuals to work as they are probably there were but they resolved right and therefore we only have authoritarian uh, institutions that exist right and same point about you know same other criticism that we have of you know model is gone like an anarchy why can't we have an institution where there are no hierarchies probably they existed right but they dissolved and i think and there is of course i mean and that is not something that is mere conjecture uh, we have archaeological and we have historical evidences of uh, societies that existed that were egalitarian for example uh, we have uh, cattle hoyak in anatolian plains that was that where the modern day uh, modern day uh, turkey is right uh, from 7100 bc to somewhere about 5700 bc we had this sort of a uh, society there which was which you know everyone you know doesn't matter which you know what is your function society you just lived in a similar house you performed i mean you know you like sort of performed the similar function you lived a similar life there was no class there was no uh, sort of you know overarching uh, you know institution there was no government people just lived happily and freely right but places like katal hoyak don't exist anymore right so that i just speak something about uh, the authoritarian you know nature of human institutions a genealogy of authoritarian institution why they are like that probably that is the only way that they can be and i i know that is a very grim picture that is being painted in front of us but it is our job as students of philosophy to sort of engage with these difficult questions and ask can there be a society that can be any other way round right and it is of course not an easy question and we are not the first ones to ask these questions people have been asking that for centuries for millennia we don't have an ideal answer just as of yet we don't know if we'll have any but we carry on we engage we try to discuss we try to debate we try to hypothesize we try to prove we try to research and come up with an explanation that probably would you know make our lives a bit more easier if not solve all the fundamental questions of human existence in one day Ha huh, that was a very heartwarming point that you brought in thank you devayan okay um I, let's you know let's uh, sort of end like go towards you know closing this session we'll just have uh, i mean uh, move towards you know the the conclusion of entire you know this thing and we'll proceed in that direction so yeah i mean uh, uh whatever remarks that we had we are going to try to sum up you know what we have discussed so far and you know we'll try to sort of add new points if you know they explain all something that we have already discussed something like that and you know towards in the next 10 minutes we'll close it but yeah what i thought about today's discussion was i firstly really really enjoyed it i think that yeah i think that the points that we brought up were really fun to think about and discuss about and every point that came up also did sort of change my perspective in a way that hearing to the bind speaking nimble speaking and i mean it and that i um all of that produced these small little ideas so so what i was thinking about caste because the bind and abhi were talking about caste led me to think about the um the hypocrisy of the method that they've employed which is you know the myth of the metals and i think that that talking about that hypocrisy then led me to consider that okay there's a lot of contradictions within this idealistic view that plato has of a society and i think in a way that how discussion should flow right like each discussion giving rise to the new topic of discussion so in that sense i really really like
today's meeting and yeah i mean uh, like uh, we have already given like one you know this crash course and this uh, uh, link to that po- uh, podcast if you have you know find any free time please do go through it they are like very good sources and when i was just starting to go into philosophy they really helped me and you know uh like linked me to sort of works that i might have interest in right so i used to listen to these podcasts and you know then i used to listen to all to all these ideas and of course some i liked some like like me right and anything like and i i just went and the ones that i really liked you know i used to take out the primary text of that and read right and because i had already listened to their ideas and so before then i had a you know good understanding of oh you know this is what the larger broad ideas now i can understand and you know uh, go through the primary text easily so that's something that really helps and that is something and advice that i would always give to people who are you know who want to read primary text to understand philosophy is that it's not a like a like a mystery novel right <laughs> that if you get spoilers towards the end you will uh, you know you will just the fun of it will spoil you know <laughs> you are trying to understand the concept and if you have a basic understanding of it to build on from it is always easier than to you know just uh, pick up a primary text at you know okay you know i will take up phenomenology of spirit today and you know i'll just finish it and i'll understand hegel you probably much much of the things will just go over your head because you know the concepts are sort of built in that way that makes it difficult to you know consume that so first have a basic idea through these uh, wikipedia uh, or you know videos podcast whatever and from that you know if you read the primary text it really helps that that helped me personally of course i cannot speak for everyone but yeah yeah definitely and crash course generally is fantastic like i, I know that there's probably a lot of people in this batch of watch the crash courses for other subjects so they know but yeah crash course for philosophy is really really fantastic so it, it won't be like it's because it's not a lecture and it's not a class I mean, it's meant to be, of course, like instructive. It's meant to be educative, but it's it, it's 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 honestly really phenomenal. The production quality, the method of teaching, just everything that Crash Course has, it's really phenomenal. So it's a really really good place to start. Okay, Doki. Um, if you have, if you want to say something, can all also type it down, uh, on the you know on the chat box. That is also fine. i think uh, yeah uh, now you know i think uh, we'll just move on to concluding the arguments uh, as far as the next meeting is concerned uh, you just you know just go through the the you know the shorthand notes or explanations of the two previous ones or you know the podcast episodes of those that will i think give you i mean sufficient understanding that you know you'll not be lost in our next discussion anyway because anyway you know we are just uh, because we have just you know the, the first two discussion was sort of tertiary you know i mean like uh, not an exactly we're not exactly discussing uh, the fundamental concepts of philosophy yet right next abhi to matlab like we are just you know trying to work around things and you know how we we're trying to experiment and that is why we're talking we're choosing points that you know like political construction ya fir you know historical understanding of philosophy to stand with he to you know bring a basis next say next time we are just you know delving into serious philosophy now we are delving into plato's metaphysics and plato's epistemology uh, right which is basically you know two big words for kya kehte hain metaphysics is basically you know understanding of the natural you know world through you know the sans our uh, observational understanding right and uh, epistemo- epistemology is basically you know the 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 under- uh, the 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 branch of uh, philosophy that deals with how do we know stuff we ask questions like how do we know the things that we know how does knowledge work right so basically we'll be delving into these aspects of plato uh, we are we have already delved with these aspects of plato if you can tell we have discussed forms and you know we discussed all these things uh the reason that we did not go into great detail with them was of course because we are saving it for the next session where we will get into the forms properly the world of forms and you know his conception of plato's and you know basically we'll be delving into plato's idealism uh his you know idealism is basically you know uh understanding that the real world that we see around observations so that is not something that you know exists in the Uh, like you know that is not the real there is some higher reality so that is basically idealism and then we will contradict to contradict that to 
Aristotle's version of you know Aristotle's philosophy, which is basically that everything that we want to know, we can just you know get that through observation. You don't need to look for the world of forms or intelligible real higher reality or stuff like that. So yeah, um, we'll be getting into serious philosophy from the next session. Uh, so yeah, uh, you, you're not at all late in joining us, Ashani. Uh, in fact, you have just joined us, you know, like just the, before, you know, where if if probably uh, after the next session, if you had, you know, if someone tries to get in, then they will have to properly read the stuff from before because uh, you cannot talk about Aristotle's philosophy without, you know, uh, understanding Plato's philosophy because it's a lot of it is referential, right? Aristotle references a lot of Plato's work and Plato's understanding, Plato's philosophy. And that is something that goes on, right? That, you know, we have thinkers responding to previous thinkers and responding to the questions that have occurred in their times, right? And that is something that happens that, and, you know, you need to uh, sort of keep up with uh, these things, at least in a single school, right? Like in Greco-Roman school, if you are reading, you know, in, pick up a certain book in between, it will always be difficult to understand because the the you need to understand that, right? But you will not face this, like a lot of this, you know, problem when you just, you know, like, like if you just start from, let's say, you know, the philosophy of Renaissance, right? Of course, they will reference old philosophies, but they will not be engaging that deeply in that because they're not that contemporary, right? But of course, you need an understanding of it because they, of course, respond to it. But yeah, I'm just saying that it is not that necessary uh, as compared to studying the you know philosophers of the same school. So that you have to do chronologically. That is something that you have to do. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you know, uh, before we close this meeting, if anyone would uh, want to, uh, you know, add something, I, I think, you know, we, if we can add had some concluding remarks about the entire, uh, you know, Republic from people who have spoken about what they're taking back from the session or, you know, what they... Uh, where are we uh, with sons to our understanding of Plato's Republic? If we can have small statements for that, you know, that would be amazing. Yeah, so mainly what I took away from our discussion, um, well, there's a lot of things, but mainly what I did take away was firstly, um, how important it is, I think, to analyze a historical text with proper historical context. Because maybe if we hadn't seen how the Republic was written after Plato watched his mentor be put to death by essentially a mob at Athens, his view of the state might have been really different. And then we might have analyzed this text differently. But at least a lot of my own ideas about the text were influenced by my knowledge that, okay, I know that Plato watched this happen, which is why he must have had this in mind. So that's one thing which I took away. The second thing which I took away was a general, was a general belief about the tendency of philosophers, at least ancient philosophers, to preserve knowledge for themselves or to preserve hierarchies. And it does, it, it did make me question whether all of these ancient systems of government, which were thought to be permanent, whether all of them believed in entrenched hierarchy. But that's not as much about philosophy as it is about, well, politics, maybe, or maybe it's both. Uh, yeah, I think those were the two most pertinent points for me. Other than that, of course, uh, there's a deeper understanding of the Republic for sure. Because also listening to what people were saying contrary to what I was saying, um, because I was well very very anti Plato because I saw a lot of contradictions in it, and seeing how other people were dealing with those contradictions and how thinking that okay this is not really a contradiction it is like it is defended by this it, it did broaden my perspective about Plato as a philosopher and I do feel like Plato as a philosopher is more grey than white or black well of course most philosophers are more gray, gray but plato even for his own times because a lot of his beliefs were radical for his own times his belief in equality but then of course for us that's not really as radical we see it as very problematic but it's easier to put plato in the gray category than someone like aristotle whom we would almost immediately say all right this is really really bigoted and this is more towards the darker side of things than not plato it, is not really as divisive or of a divisive as a figure, at least for me, because I feel like with Plato, there's a lot of nuance that we can cover. That we can see how flawed the society is at one time 
and then also saying that okay but maybe he really did have egalitarianism in mind when making this society that maybe he's not really motivated by cynicism or he's not motivated by narcissism or not motivated by giving himself a higher position in the hierarchy maybe he actually does believe that the society will but produce justice for all so yeah it was a really really interesting discussion for me thank you ayan and yeah definitely i think that is one of the key takeaways that you know that uh, that about uh, philosophical discussion as a whole right that the reason that we had we are doing uh, you know philosophy in this philosophy club in a in a you know discuss in a, in a manner of a discussion is because of course we have our readings of text we have our uh understanding of text but that is of course severely limited by our own perspectives but when we pour in the perspectives of an entire section uh, of people who have who come from different background different uh, you know uh different uh, economic social and political uh, you know uh, realities then they come together and they do a reading of Uh, of the same text and they get different ideas from it they take away different things of it and then you pour in all of them together and you sort of have an understanding that is more nuanced that is uh, a, a a bit more uh, you know uh, has a bit more flavor to it than you know your own understanding of it and i think that is why the philosophy club itself exists and that is why the institution of university itself exists that we have people from you know different perspective different walks of life coming together and you know this creating knowledge together right we are just not exchanging knowledge we are creating knowledge because when you work together in such a manner you get ideas that you previously did not have you know collectively even right but you know the way that i listen to nitai talk i listen to ayan talk devayan talk that gave me an understanding that i neither they previously had neither i previous uh, i previously had you know sort of how knowledge was created in that and i think plato would really agree but you know before but we haven't gone into plato's epistemology and let's save that for the next session which is about plato's metaphysics and epistemology and all the recommended texts will of course be sent to you and we will be joining each other for the discussion next time which will be more technical and which will be more uh, philosophically juicy i would say uh, than you know our previous two discussions so yeah um, that is about it thank you everyone who has joined us today it was a wonderful discussion and i'll we'll see everyone next time bye Thank you.